Welcome. Last things first. Just as this broadcast is ending in a half hour, the 10 leading GOP presidential hopefuls will be lining up behind a picket fence of podiums to debate the economy. So on this World Series night, we offer our pregame show. Don't think baseball. Think... Yes, the horse race. The big news is that developer Donald Trump and Dr. Ben Carson now appear to be neck and neck nationally. A New York Times CBS News survey has Carson leading by a nose, but in Iowa, where voters caucus first, it's by a length. A Monmouth University poll of likely Iowa voters has Carson leading Trump 32 percent to 18 percent, with Ted Cruz at 10 percent, Marco Rubio also at 10, Jeb Bush at 8 percent, and Carly Fiorina registering with voters at 5 percent. So Carson's way ahead. Why? Some like his soft-spoken bedside manner. But at the same time, his controversial statements are helping him in Iowa. An earlier Des Moines Register Bloomberg politics poll of likely voters reflects what Iowa Republicans think of Carson's comment about Muslims being unsuitable for the presidency. Adding those blue areas together, a 73 percent majority said the comment made him an attractive candidate. And here are those same respondents reacting to the doctor declaring that Obamacare was the worst thing to happen to this country since slavery. 81 percent found him to be appealing as a result. Important to add something about Marco Rubio here. He's still very uh, relatively low in the polls. But if you believe in the wisdom of crowds, Senator Rubio rates highest in the predicted likelihood of actually capturing the nomination. This according to Microsoft Research Project PredictWise, which factors in not just the polling numbers, but also those who are betting on the outcome. All right, what to make of all these numbers? Let's turn to our analysts for that and also ask what are the economic issues that the candidates might stress in tonight's third GOP debate. Joining us, Seth Lipsky, founder and editor of The New York Sun, and Josh Barrow, reporter for The New York Times data unit called The Upshot. Welcome, both of you. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Josh, this, nice is, to be here. this is your newspaper's new poll. Yeah. Uh, so if Trump was in the lead nationally and now it's Carson, which voters are switching horses in mid-campaign? Well, this, this was a long time coming. While Donald Trump has led essentially all the polls for about 100 days, his, his lead had been narrowing, mostly about a rise for Ben Carson. Donald Trump's poll numbers are still in the 20s, still quite strong. You see his strength is greatest in Iowa. It's clear that he's doing best with evangelical Christians who make up a very large share of the electorate in the Iowa caucuses, not as large a share in, in, in the New Hampshire primary. One really unusual phenomenon of this campaign, actually, has been the diversity of Donald Trump's coalition. When you look at who's supporting him, he does about as well with people who say they're very conservative as he does with people who say that they're moderate. Um, his voters are a little bit less educated and a little bit lower income on average than the Republican electorate overall, overall but not lopsidedly. He's not a candidate like Ted Cruz, who draws almost exclusively for, from self-identified very conservatives. So it's clear that Ben Carson has been consolidating a base of support with evangelicals and is doing pretty well across the board. Donald Trump also still doing pretty well across the board. It's the establishment candidate who are doing very badly. And one other data point before we bring in Seth. I, th I think the poll found that Carson's support is at this point relatively shallow. Right. So people are more likely to bolt from him than Donald Trump's supporters are from him, that they're really believing in Trump at this point. Right, yeah. 80% uh, of, of Ben Carson's supporters say that they might change their minds and vote for somebody else. Only 45% of Donald Trump's supporters said that. Now, granted, voters aren't always the best indicators of their own future actions. I'm sure there are some people who say they're absolutely going to vote for Donald Trump who will, in fact, change their minds before the election. But I think that is an indicator that people like Ben Carson, they're still getting to know him. They are not as sold on him as Donald Trump supporters believe themselves to be with Trump. So, Seth, how do you think Trump might go after Carson tonight if Trump is now suddenly number two? He hangs so much on his image as a winner, and we know just how critical he can be of people who he thinks are his main competition. Yeah, it's probably a dangerous game to predict how Donald Trump is going to behave. <laughs> uh, I found uh, Josh's reprise of those numbers very interesting, very illuminating. Uh, the uh, sense that I have is so far it's more about temperament than about policy positions. Uh, I think uh, the degree to which Carson has advanced over Trump probably reflects a certain appreciation 
for his temperament. The reason people maybe are waiting to move away from him to whoever one of the candidates emerges is they're waiting for them to strike a serious policy position, which one really hasn't heard yet from the Republican so-called mainstream candidates. So I, you know, it's obviously very early, you know, this time a year ago, Howard, I mean, in, you know, 2000, whatever it was, Howard Dean was a right. superstar. <laughs> but, uh, but I found that interesting what Josh uh, Now, Ben Carson has just launched his first television commercials. He did very well at fundraising this summer, even though he was tending to raise through smaller donations uh, than some of the other Republican candidates and some of the Democrats, uh, too, or Hillary Clinton in particular. But here is the first thing he's spending that money on as far as television. Let's watch. Did you know Washington is built on a swamp? Massive government debt, stifling regulation, special interest politics, partisan dysfunction. Now it all makes sense. Washington is broken. The political class broke it. Together, we can drain the swamp and protect our children's future. I'm Ben Carson, and I approve this message. So, Seth, by your lights, does he start to get to important issues in that spot? Well, I think it's, to me, what, what has been broken in Washington? So the New York Sun, which I edit, has been trying to... Uh, argue for years now. Conservative that it, paper, we should say, for people who don't know it. Uh, a website now was a print paper. Uh, we press the monetary issue as the missing element in this debate. The Federal Reserve. The, it's not just the Federal, the Federal Reserve for sure, but the monetary system. We uh, closed the gold window in the 1970s and went to an era of fiat currency when the dollar is not connected to any gold, silver, or other species. It's not defined in law. And since that date, extraordinary things have happened. Unemployment has soared. Bankruptcy rates have soared. Elizabeth Warren's great issue. Uh, inequality has soared. That's uh, Thomas Piketty's right. famous chart nine. So, so and, for, and, so, right. so and, for example, you think um, they're doing the same thing they did before the housing bubble burst, um, letting out loans that are too backed by the federal government and that sort of thing. But I want to ask you, Josh, yeah. do you think in this economic debate, and this is on CNBC, which is you know a finance channel, Wall Street-based right. channel, is that going to come up or is that too wonky for television as far as they're concerned? I, I, I think it's remarkable. There, as far as I can tell in the first two Republican debates, there's been no discussion of monetary policy at all. No questions about it, not even anybody sort of jumping in to talk about it. And I think, you know... I, when Republicans do talk about monetary policy in debates, it is usually not very illuminating. You get a lot of ranting against the Fed. The Fed, I think, has been the one part of the federal government that's actually worked really well over the last eight or nine years. And when you look to a place that had monetary policies, frankly, closer to what Seth wants, I'd, I'd look at Europe, which had a much tighter monetary policy over the last 10 years and, and had much worse results. So I think, in general, what you, what you get when you get politicians talking about the Fed in a circumstance like this is just blaming the Fed for things and saying the Fed's printing way too much money and saying that inflation is really high even though it isn't. So on some level, I've actually been glad that they haven't talked about monetary policy because they almost never say anything smart about it. Ben Bernanke, who just, just came out with his mem memoir, talks extensively about how basically how frustrating it was for him that things elected officials say about monetary policy and what the Fed is doing never make any sense. Um, but I do think that uh, it, it will be an opportunity for more substance on economic policy. I think there are real differences between the candidates on their tax plans. And I think they will get into that some. I'd really like to see them talk about what they're going to do for ordinary middle-income families. Republicans, for thir going back 30 years, their prescription to grow the economy is tax cuts. Um, and it hasn't been really effective when we've tried it, as with the Bush tax cuts. But it also doesn't mean a lot for people who don't pay a lot of taxes, which is a lot of people in the middle. Um, Donald Trump is the one candidate, frankly, who has really focused a lot on those people. I think his prescriptions are wrong. It's that we need higher trade barriers and more barriers to immigration. He thinks that'll push wages up. But at least he's talking about things other than taxes that really go directly to middle-income economic interests. Just, Seth, on the tax plans, the Republicans have pretty different plans in some respects but they don't seem to give much of a break to the middle class. I'm looking at my notes here. They generally lower the top tax rate, 
the corporate rate and the capital gains rate. Rubio would drop capital gains altogether. The bottom people get a modest break in most of these plans. Can the Republicans run in the era of concentrated wealth and long-term stagnation of middle-class wages on just, you know, all policies to benefit the rich and everything else will trickle down in the form of growth? So I would argue that the big disparities and inequality that Thomas Piketty charts happened starting in the 1970s when we went to fiat money where you incent these vast, uh, these vast funds uh, uh, that that create these great disparities in wealth. I'm not blaming the funds. I'm blaming the institution to which the monetary powers were delegated by the, yeah. by the Constitution, which is the Congress. What else on that, Josh? I mean, that's just such a red herring. I mean, inequality is not, is not even fundamentally about monetary policy. The main, the main effect that monetary policy has had over the last few years has been on the overall level of economic growth, which has been poor because, because central banks, right. frankly, have been too timid about about easing but in in any case i think on on the question of inequality i think tax taxes matter enormously for inequality the main differences in inequality in the us versus other advanced countries have to do with after tax income which is to say our pre tax income distribution isn't that mo- much more unequal it's just that we uh, have somewhat less uh, progressive taxation especially at the state and local level and much less progressive government spending so yeah i think that's essential to the to the conversation about inequality but republicans have moved back basically in the direction toward being focused more on big tax cuts at the top i think actually and also more talking about Omnibus. growth if i can yeah. throw that in because yeah. jeb bush has been running for a while on returning to a four percent growth rate if you want stagnation to stop have a lot of growth in the economy there'll be upward pressure on it's employment nice and on wages we haven't had four percent growth in the economy in any sustained way in a very long time yeah. but is that what they're going to be debating tonight do you think well i mean i'm sure they will all talk about how they like economic growth it's not going to be a point of 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 you know contention between them about whether four percent economic growth would be or good. how to get there. But the problem is that this this is literally a number Jeb Bush made up. He was in a meeting at the George W. Bush Foundation and was basically like, "Well, gee, shouldn't we have an initiative toward four percent growth? Four percent growth would be great for the country." And then they've reverse engineered an argument for why it is feasible to reach that growth number. When you talk with economists, they will almost all tell you that that is not a sustainable goal for long running economic growth, given our population growth trends and how there has been a global slowdown in innovation for decades. But but the other problem with Bush making that proposal is what's to stop anybody else from saying, let's grow faster than that. Donald Trump says he'll make 6% growth. I mean, literally, it's just a bidding war about how optimistic we'll be about the economy. But, Based on but no policy is going to create that on a, on a long-term sustainable All right. basis. You two stay right there. Time for evidence-based politics. What could tonight's GOP contenders learn from past primary debates? Let's look at some recent research analyzing the 2012 primary debates. That year saw fewer GOP contenders than this year's stampede, only Rick Santorum, Ron Huntsman, Ron Paul, Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain, Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, and of course Mitt Romney. The research published in Presidential Studies Quarterly found that candidates shortchanged on camera time used humor as a tactic to gain ground, that the venue of the debate played an important role in the competition, and applause matters. The author of that and related studies joins us via Skype. He is Patrick Stewart, professor of political science at the University of Arkansas. Professor, welcome. Thank you for having me. And Seth and Josh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, Professor, who caused the audience to laugh the most overall in 2012, since you were measuring that? And who got the most applause in televised primary debates? Well, it was Newt Gingrich who really had the most uh, uh, laughter events that occurred. And as far as applause goes, it really wasn't that much different. They were all applauded to relatively equally. So it wasn't as good an indicator of support as laughter was. One unusual debate that you measured was in Florida, where the broadcast network prohibited the audience from applauding. And you express an opinion that that's a, a bad idea in primary debates, even if it's a good idea in general election debates. Why do you think so? And why did they do that in the first place? 
Well, it wasn't me that really thought that it was a bad idea. Now, certainly I agree with it, but it was Newt Gingrich who said, hey, look, this is free speech for the audience. And one of the things that I found with the study is that the applause was diminished because applause is something that you do cognitively. And while the laughter, the length of the laughter was diminished, the laughter events were not diminished to a great extent. Now, what this means is that laughter is very important, especially within groups such as the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, for people to bond with each other. It's very much of a contagious thing, but even more contagious when you're dealing with people who are like you, that you as, identify with. As a matter of research, were you able to identify any uptick in polling based on the laughter generated in debates? Well, that's the problem. Is It's a correlational thing. Looking at the debates in South Carolina, we saw that Newt Gingrich was able to get an awful lot of laughter, and that led to his very much of a successful run with that election there. But as far as tying that causal link together, it's social science research. To get into the brains of the voters, it's a difficult sort of thing. So that will be stepping a little bit too far outside the uh, bounds of my abilities. Um, you wrote that a theory that primary debate uh, debates matter early on, but not in the long run, is a prominent theory. Why would that be, and does your research tend to back that up? Well, the research has yet to be done, but the argument is, is that the primary debates are the first time that we actually come in contact with these individuals in a relatively unmediated manner. In other words, they aren't stage managed, these candidates. So we get to see them as they are, how they react to unusual events, and we can draw our conclusions about them as is, which leads to us liking them or not liking them so much in later events, later debates, and on down the road, and maybe voting for them or not. But when it comes down to that last debates that we have between the contenders from both political parties, essentially, debates are for losers. In other words, if you perform poorly, you will lose public opinion polling numbers there. Based on your research in 2012, or based on your research about the 2012 televised primary debates, what are you watching for this year, and what will you be watching for tonight? Well, I'm watching for uh, three things. I I'm working with a couple of colleagues, uh, actually students of mine, Austin Eubanks and Jason Miller, and what we're doing is we're coding for camera shots. So in other words, are they shown as individuals? Or are they shown side by side or split screen shots, which are more competitive shots? Or are they shown as just amongst one of the candidates? So it's not just the shots, but also how often they're shown. So that, the amount of speaking time that they have, but then also the audience response, which is very important. And what's different about this debate, the debates, especially with the Republican Party, is we're hearing mixtures of laughter and applause but also applause and boos. So that might show that there is a schism within the Republican Party, especially as concerns specific candidates. So let's show an example of that from this year. This is a brief exchange between candidates Rand Paul and Chris Christie. I don't trust President Obama with our records. I know you gave him a big hug, and if you want to give him a big hug again, go right ahead. And Now, one of the things about that is they used a split screen technique. Mm -hmm. Paul and Christie were not actually standing next to each other. And related to what you said a minute ago, there was a mixture of cheers and boos, I thought, for that Rand Paul line that I could hear from the crowd. Oh, yes, most definitely. And the thing that's interesting about that split screen shot, that production decision there, is they're in each other's faces. It's almost man to man, hand to hand combat going on there. Uh, as a result of that, despite the fact that they're all the way across the stage from each other. That and the audience response, which was incredibly large because it was held in the Cleveland Cavalier Stadium, was exceptional. It tells us a little bit of information about that debate and how people feel about the schism within the party itself. So, Josh Barrow, let me bring you into this. And, and Seth, if either of you want to ask uh, our researcher guest a question, you can do that. Uh, but also, do you think they're playing for laughter? Do you think they're playing for applause? Do you think they've quantified out how these things might help their campaign? Well, I thought, I thought it was interesting that the candidates who are start for time use 
laughter because Jim Webb tried to use the tactic of just complaining a lot about how he was starved for time, which seemed to be a, a less successful tactic. But I'm interested to know, bo both the Republican and Democratic parties have worked very hard this cycle to limit the quantity of debates. There seemed to be this sense, especially on the Republican side, that the party had done damage to itself by having too many debates. And I'm wondering, do, do you think that's right? And how does that affect the nature of the debates, given that, you know, we're time limited, we're only going to get 12 on the Republican side, and what is it, six or eight on the Democratic side? Mm -hmm. What is, how, what is that change how the candidates have to behave and does it change how people can actually use the debates to, to their benefit? Well, I, I think the important thing is that if you're a front runner, you don't want to have many debates because that's more opportunity to uh, have a gaffe, to make a mistake. Now, it's not just about how much time or how many laughter events you have. It's also what exactly you say, what sort of humor you use that matters. For instance, if you're a second tier candidate, if you're trying to make your name, what you want to do is you either want to make a humorous comment that attacks the leading candidates. In other words, you can't be seen as too impolite and humor allows you to do that or attack the other party or some form of outgroup. On the other hand, if you're a front runner, the real humor that you can use is self deprecatory humor. You want to make yourself more appealing to the general public by making fun of some foibles you have. And that also allows for you to kind of turn aside maybe some concerns that some of the voters might have about. So here's a couple of examples from this year's debate so far. Uh, first one, Jeb Bush, who Trump calls low energy, as we know, was asked what he would take as his Secret Service nickname if elected president. Ever ready. It's very high energy, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ever ready. So there's the self-deprecating humor. And here's another example. Watch this clip, too. When the war, uh, when the issue occurred in 2003, I suggested to President Bush uh, that he not go to war. Okay, so I, I just want that on the record. A much more serious clip, obviously, but what they had in common was that there were high fives, there were handshakes, there were fist bumps among these rivals. I'm not sure I've ever seen that. So what about Jeb Bush's humor and what about all this touching? Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about the humor. That was incredible because it was self-deprecatory in the sense that you had Jeb Bush making fun of his low energy persona that Trump had put out there, but at the same time attacking Donald Trump. Now, there is also a physical element to that, especially with that low five. You go ahead and see, yes, Donald Trump says, oh, you got me on that one. But Jeb Bush is really upset. You can see by the amount of power that he put into that low five. And actually, there's recoil in Jeb Bush's hand. And at the same time he hit that hand, there's a micro expression of anger that goes right over Jeb Bush's face for just that moment. Seth, so you, had, that, you had a question for the professor? You know, I'm wondering, uh, aside from technique and process and humor, whether you think there could be a debate organized around a single approach. The New York Sun has called for a debate on the Constitution. You know, it's the only document all these people are going to swear to support. Uh, what are their constitutional views? How could, could mm -hmm. there be a debate mm -hmm. focused on their view of the document they're going to support. All right, real quick, as we're almost out of time, Professor Stewart. Well, I, I think certainly that's an approach, but it's one that actually there's a, a great clip about Newt Gingrich saying that he would debate Barack Obama in a Lincoln-Douglas debate. But here's the thing, Lincoln-Douglas debates are three, four hours long, focusing on the insights and ins and outs and the truth of it is, is to go into the depth of the policy there might not be as appreciated by the general public. And the thing is, when we make choices about our leaders, we're making decisions that are thin slice, evolutionarily based decisions in which who is the individual that can best respond to the problems that are facing us in the future. So these emotionally driven decisions might be more accurate than policy driven decisions because policies, they come and they go. And we want our leaders to be able to adapt 
two different policies and two and, different problems. And Josh, this debate that's about to start mm -hmm. is kind of on one topic. It's being billed by CNBC as an economics debate, but do you think they're really going to stick to that set of issues? Well, I mean, the economy is a broad issue, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the, that, you know, the a lot there are a lot of economic issues that have not been dealt with or have not been dealt with in depth in prior debates and there's been a lot of foreign policy conversation in the previous debates it's not saying that we shouldn't talk about foreign policy but i think the journalists at cnbc know what their expertise is and i, I would expect an economics focused debate with some more policy depth than we've seen professor one more question to you um carly fiorina broke out via her debate performance in the first you know kids table debate to make it higher in the polls and onto the main stage. Uh, Martin O'Malley had that possibility, had that opportunity in the Democratic debate. People were anticipating a Carly Fiorina moment, but it didn't happen. What was the difference between the two as you saw it and as you would measure it? Well, I think the interesting thing is that Carly Fiorina was treated like a top tier candidate in the amount of time that she received to speak, as well as how she was presented visually in that second debate, despite her not really polling exceptionally well. On top of that, the drive time debates, most people probably were just listening to it. So the question is, is she, is she emotionally as expressive as we would want from a candidate? Um, Martin O'Malley, for his part, I think he's an attractive candidate. I think he has the ability to connect with the general public. And now he will have more time without the two other candidates who have dropped out already. So it is yet to be seen. And I'm looking forward to this upcoming debates to see what happens with both of them. So full circle, what should Trump do to get back on top if that's his goal tonight? I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in the business of being <coughs> Donald Trump's campaign strategist. I think Donald Trump has defied advice, right? He kept doing these things and people were like, oh, now his campaign's over. Oh, that's crazy. You can't do that. Uh, and yet he has stayed in approximately the same place. And though people seem to want to write his obituary, he's still polling very well and ahead of most of the candidates. So I think he knows better than I do what he needs to do to, to reposition himself tonight. All right, Professor Patrick Stewart, researcher on debates. Thank you very much, Patrick Stewart and Data. I've always wanted to say that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Josh and Seth, thank you both very much. Too. Thanks. You're welcome. And that's it for this week's edition of POTUS 2016. We're here each week at this hour covering the presidential horse race and using rigorous research to deconstruct the campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.